Assalamu alaikum. Just want to give everybody a little short message before the video starts that this Theodicy class will be a weekly series ongoing on our Patreon. So I encourage everybody to go and take a look at the different tier levels that we have on Patreon. And for anybody that, you know, doesn't want to, that's totally fine. The episodes will be uploaded to YouTube a month or two, roughly after they have been uploaded to Patreon. So I really encourage anybody to go and check out the tiers. And to our current patrons, I want to just thank you for sticking with us for so long. We have been quite inactive on all of our social medias, not just Patreon. And that's, you know, no fault of your own. There have been a lot of things going on in our personal lives that kept us away from all that. So I just want to thank the patrons for sticking with us for so long and also our subscribers on YouTube. So please go and check out the Patreon and I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد. Today we are going to begin a, a course, a brief course, in which we want to look at theodicy, or the problem of evil, in Islamic thought. And there is in fact an excellent book, which has almost that exact title, namely Theodicy in Islamic Thought. It's by Eric L. Ormsby. Although the main title is very general, the subtitle <clears throat> qualifies it somewhat more by saying the dispute over Al-Ghazali's best of all possible worlds. So this book is a consideration of theodicy and Islamic thought, but specifically in reference to uh, a statement of Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, who died in the year 505, or um, what is it, 1111 of the Common Era. Um, but this is a good place, a very excellent book actually to use for a course like this as a kind of point of departure for the discussion of this question, especially for people who don't know <clears throat> the Arabic language. It's a very serious book. It's kind of old. I think it was published in 1984. Yes, it was published in 1984, and it's a Princeton University Press publication. It is, in fact, the published version of the PhD dissertation by Ormsby at that at the very same university. <clears throat> so I thought that this would be an excellent point of departure, and uh, that is to say that this book, this textbook, would be an excellent point of departure to examine this question. Uh, the question of the problem of evil, but it's presented in a very unique way in Al-Ghazali. I mean, theodicy, as it um, emerged in Western philosophy, didn't really emerge in the same way as a question in Islamic philosophy, and Al-Ghazali deals with it in a very particular way. It's really a debate over what we might call um, the uh, best of all possible worlds debate uh, or uh, you know does the universe as Allah has created it truly embody uh, truly um, manifest the um, perfect optimum conditions in other words is the actuality of existence optimum is it perfectly right and so we speak of and indeed, this is a phrase from Ormsby's book, The Perfect Rightness of the Actual. It's a very important question because I think that um, many people who are uh, atheists or who are led to atheism or who abandon any kind of a theistic belief do so often not really because of any great metaphysical arguments, but because of their own personal experience and the general human experience of suffering, the experience of evil. And um, there are no end to the examples of these things in human experience. At the time of this class, at the time of this recording, um, the world is still plunged into a massive uh, epidemic, a pandemic indeed. In some places, it's, things are better. In some places, things are worse, such as in India. There have been horrific images 
of death and disease and cremation of bodies and really horrible images to look at. Right now in uh, Palestine, we have the latest brutal iteration of uh, the murder and mayhem that takes place there. Um, so there's no end to these kind of examples, whether it's natural disasters or even personal misfortunes and so forth. So how uh, do we approach the question? Well, there were a number of things in uh, Islamic thought. There were a number of approaches in Islamic thought, but it wasn't a distinct and different, distinct sort of um, area of investigation, by way, that is to say, theodicy. So let's look at this. Um, since we are speaking in English, we do have a kind of Western philosophical uh, vocabulary, and so we kind of have to filter those things and understand exactly where that's coming from and then see how the problem played out in the Islamic tradition. So theodicy as a term, if you actually look in the Oxford English Dictionary, <clears throat> it comes via the French through a treatise which was written by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz in French, although his native language I imagine would have been German, and people in those days also wrote in Latin. You can get an English translation of um, his treatise on theodicy. This is published by the Open Court Press, La Salle, Illinois. Um, when was this? Yeah, it was 1985, 88, 1990, 1993. I don't know if it's even still in print. There might be some other presses, but it is available in its original Open Court Press um, on the used book market. So the term really comes from there. And uh, <coughs> Leibniz takes it, or coins it from the Greek, theos, of course meaning God, and um, dije meaning justice. And um, Ormsby indicates this in the very opening of his introduction, in the very first page, uh, which is uh, happens to be page three. So the term uh, theodicy, originally coined by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, um, from the Greek words for God, Theos, and Justice, Dije, is commonly used in two senses. In its first original and proper sense, the Odyssey denotes the attempt to demonstrate that the divine justice remains uncompromised by manifold evils of existence. He goes on to say it is an attempt in Milton's words, that's John Milton, Paradise Lost, uh, to justify the ways of God to men. <clears throat> it can also have uh, according to Immanuel Kant, he says, the defense of the Creator's supreme wisdom against the charge which reason brings on the basis of what is contrary to purpose in the world. Contrary to purpose, the original German he has here as das Zweckwidrige, I think. So if you are interested in German, if you know German, you can ponder that. He, there is a second, um, uh, uh, broader sense as well to the term theodicy, also brought in here by Ormsby, which is it has come to signify God's concern and solicitude for creation in general, and so often appears as synonymous with providence itself. And he goes on to say that the secondary usage is not of cons his concern in this study. And as I said, if you actually go to the Oxford English Dictionary, that would be what you would find there as well. It's attributed to uh, Leibniz, and then it says the, with a definite article, or a indefinite article, vindication of the divine attributes, especially justice and holiness in respect to the existence of evil. So it's all about the problem of evil. So you've got evil in the world and you have God. God is supposed to be perfectly good and perfectly just and omnipotent. So why does he allow evil? And then it goes on to say that theodicy, the term can refer to the writing or a writing, uh, sorry, not the or a, a writing, doctrine or theory intended to justify the ways of God to men. Again, echoing John Milton, the justification of the ways of God to men. <clears throat> so when you have the problem of theodicy, you really are trying to balance the perfect, right, sorry, the divine justice with the divine power. Um, and you have in the Islamic context the notion 
that uh, trials are a part of existence, that they are a part of life. So, for example, in Surah Al Mulk, it says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim Tabarak al Ladi Biyadi al Mulk al Ladi Khalaq al Mauta wal Hayata li abluukum ayukum ahsanu amala. Uh, which says that uh, glory be to Allah in whose hands is the dominion. Tabarak al-Ladhi bi al-Mulku wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir and he is, has a complete power over all things. Al-Ladhi khalaq al mauta he who created death and life that he might try thereby people to see who is mo most excellent in action. It also in um, <clears throat> Surah Al-Baqarah which is the second surah of the Quran it's, it's uh, ayah number 155 Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْسٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهُ إِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ And most certainly shall we try you, you all, humanity, بِشَيْءٍ with a measure بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ Of danger or fear وَالْجُوعِ And hunger وَنَقْسٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ And a loss of wealth وَالْأَنفُسِ Of lives وَالثَّمَرَاتِ And fruits Now fruits is going your crop could fail I suppose It could also have the sense of The fruits of one's labor <clears throat> Some of the Mufassirin have said that That ثَمَرَاتِ here Or fruits can also mean Children, offspring. وَبَشِّرَ uh, الصَّابِرِينَ But give glad tidings to those who are patient. Sabadin here can mean patient, those who persevere in the face of adversity, who, when a calamity strikes them, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ A calamity or calamity in general uh, befalls them, say, قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهُ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Indeed or truly, to Allah do we belong, and to Him truly shall we return. So there's a lot going on <clears throat> there, but the idea is that, well, trials of these kinds exist, and that people are supposed to face them with a certain measure of perseverance, patience, a kind of stoic attitude. <clears throat> but it is nevertheless a kind of philosophical and theological problem which confronted people, not just Muslims, and um, um, Ormsby uh, introduces the problem of theodicy and then goes on to look at um, the view which he calls the optimist view or, the, or optimism in Western thought and its critics. And then he presents Islamic formulations of theodicy before getting into the uh, meat of the book. So what really is the problem of theodicy as Ormsby frames it? He says that uh, he says that is this world the best? This is on page four. The optimal world possible or could God create a superior world at will? So it's not just the problem of the existence of evil, but noting the fact that evil exists. In effect, what the question is being posed is could a world have been created by God? Is he capable of making a world in which there is no evil? And so that, and so then, well, is he or isn't he? And some people will say, well, he already has uh, made the best of all possible worlds, but that best of all possible worlds demands the existence of evil. So then there's the debate, well, if you hold that, you know, is that really a claim that you can make? Is this really the best of all possible worlds? Surely God could have done better. <laughs> That's the argument. So it says, is this world the best? the optimal world possible, or could God create a superior world at will? This special question entails a certain shift of emphasis. In other words, a shift of emphasis, right, from this idea of just well, the problem of the existence of evil. Uh, and what is that shift of emphasis? Well, as I said, it's divine justice versus divine power. He says divine justice is still at stake. If God could make a better world than this world, and yet refuses to do so, can he properly be characterized as just? But the divine power is also at issue, and perhaps even more acutely so. Is God capable of creating another world, or does this world represent the full expression of his 
creative power. Now, he correctly notes that in the Islamic world, this problem of evil didn't assume a dominant position in Islamic theology. There really wasn't any question about belief in the existence of God. It was a question of really a discussion of divine attributes and the nature of the divine omnipotence and the divine will. Um, and we don't want to get too ahead of this, but Al-Ghazali originally framed uh, his um, understanding of this in the context, really, of a Sufi understanding of adversity and a Sufi understanding of suffering, a kind of spiritual understanding of how to deal with these experiences which, which every human life involves. There is no human existence. Nobody will go through this world without experiencing some kind of unhappiness, some kind of suffering. And so it was really a question of the, the spiritual Sufi response to that, is, which is the context where it comes up. So it doesn't really assume the same position as it does in Western thought. But he quite rightly says at the end of this section called The Problem of Theodicy on page 5, the concluding paragraph, he quite rightly says that the question at issue in both traditions is the same. Is this world the best that can possibly be? Or are there other superior worlds which God could create at will? The answers to this question and the reasons for those answers will differ markedly in each tradition at many points. And yet, as we might expect, there's common, common ground as well. So, um, there was a reaction to this book, and that was by someone named Voltaire. He's written this book called Candide. Candide originally appeared in 1758. This is the Penguin Books edition, uh, translated by John but B-U-T-T, uh, 1947. The translation here is copyright 1947. It's been printed many, many, many times, and the one I have is the 1986 printing. Um, so the word this book is also known as Optimism. Candide or Optimism. Candide is the name of the character, and it's a kind of uh, challenge to the idea that we live in, in the best of all possible worlds. Um, and so in that way, that in as much as it addresses this issue of the best of all possible worlds, or the, or the optimum, hence the notion of optimism, uh, it goes well with Al-Ghazali, because Al-Ghazali's formulation, we might as well introduce it right now, in this regard is uh, summarized in a kind of rhyming statement, which is, Laysa fil imkan abda mimma kan. There is nothing in existence, but, or there is nothing there in, pos, in, on, in all possibility except the perfectly marvelous. Uh, so there also you have a notion of a kind of best of all possible worlds, uh, the perfect rightness of the actual, the optimum. So optimism in this form. Um, let's look at it in the context of Western civilization. So Voltaire said that the best of all possible worlds, the notion of that, is horribly ridiculous. Uh, he said that in a letter, and this is in the book, um, so you should look at the book. Now, what prompted that? You know, just as in our time, there's all sorts of suffering going on, and of course the most... <clears throat> Uh, the most noteworthy example for the last two years now almost, or, right, is this whole coronavirus pandemic. But there's no end to <clears throat> bad things that are happening. There will be a volcanic eruption. There will be a tsunami. All sorts of things have happened in, uh, in the last so, so many years. But um, there was a particular event uh, in the context of which Voltaire was writing, apparently he made this remark, namely that the best of all possible worlds is horribly ridiculous in a letter which was dated September 17, 1756. He goes on to say, one must see everything with stoic eyes, but how when one suffers and witnesses suffering? So the question which was uh, plaguing him and others 
was this massive earthquake which had taken place in Portugal, in the city of Lisbon. Uh, this earth earthquake, it says here, the worst in recorded history claimed tens of thousands of victims in Lisbon alone, while its total force extended over an area of one million square miles. Um, and Ormsby has cited a study that uh, goes into all of this um, geologic detail, if you like. So it was a natural disaster. And with this massive loss of life, obviously people were questioning uh, this whole notion of whether we live in the best of all possible worlds and the problem of evil. Um, so you have someone, William King, who was the Bishop of Dublin, um, who was in favor of optimism, that indeed we do live in the best of all possible worlds, saying that earthquakes, storms, thunder, deluges, and inundations are sometimes sent by a just and gracious God for the punishment of mankind, but often depend on other natural causes which are necessary and could not be removed without greater damage to the whole. These concussions of the elements are indeed prejudicial, but more prejudice would arise to the universal system by the absence of them. The earth then must either not be created at all or things be, or these things be permitted. Um, so that's the view that this gentleman took. Uh, but uh, there was also, um, uh, you know, tremendous opposition, not just by Voltaire, but by, for example, David Hume in his dialogues concerning natural religion. <clears throat> he sharply questioned these ideas. Um, he says, uh, he writes there that the only method of supporting divine benevolence is to deny absolutely the misery and wickedness of man. Samuel Johnson also um, uh, trashed the uh, notion of optimism. But apparently the most penetrating critique of optimism, uh, according to Ormsby and of Theodicy in general, was that by Immanuel Kant, who wrote a German treatise against it. And um, at the end of that, he concludes, by, uh, his conclusion is that um, the attempts to reconcile divine wisdom with the undeniable fact of evil in the world are doomed to fail. They're doomed to failure. Human reason, in the argument of Kant, is by its nature incapable of fathoming the problem. Man must content himself with a purely negative wisdom. Eine negative Weisheit. He must recognize the necessary limitation of his reason, which is incapable of grasping what is too high for us. So he concludes this essay, which was written in German. It was, it's, gosh, how do you pronounce this? Über das Misslingen aller philosophischen Versuche in der Theodicy. Um, he concludes with a meditation or a, a, an essay uh, on the biblical book of, of Job or Job, Sifr Ayyub, it would be called in Arabic. And of course, Job or Job suffered a lot, and so he has this whole conclusion on that. Uh, and again, he's just saying that reason must remain, human reason must remain dumbfounded uh, when confronted by uh, evil and suffering. So he's sort of throwing up his hands and saying, you know, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to call it negative wisdom. What is negative wisdom? It just means you don't know. It's the absence of, of, of knowledge. There was an even more radical reaction against the optimistic understanding of things in Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, and uh, according to Ormsby, he was perhaps borrowing his skepticism and outright pessimism uh, from, uh, from uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte. And he says uh, here, in his famous book, Die Welt als Wille und Vorstellung, namely the world as, I, as, as what, as will and representation? I think the world, the world as idea, or no, the world as will and representation, is this. I think how it goes in English. At any rate, he says there, now, now, this world is arranged as it had to be if it were to be capable of continuing with great difficulty to exist. If it were a little worse, it would no longer be capable of continuing to exist. Consequently, since a worse world could not continue to exist, it is absolutely impossible. And so this world itself is the worst of all possible worlds. 
So unlike unlike Voltaire in his book Candide, he's not just making fun of the idea, and he's completely rejecting the idea of of Leibniz that we live in the best of poss all possible worlds uh, by saying no. In fact, we live in the worst of all possible worlds. So uh, optimism for Schopenhauer is a as a bitter mockery of the unspeakable sufferings of mankind. A bitter mockery, he calls it. Um, now there is a, another quotation from Schopenhauer, which is which is important because it's similar to what happened in the Islamic world. So those who espouse optimism, obviously, the best way to attack them is to confront them with 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 many instances of 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 of, um, of human misery, of evil, of imperfections. So that's what uh, Schopenhauer does. And so he says, if we were to conduct the most hardened and callous optimist, you know, like Leibniz, for example, through hospitals, infirmaries, operating theaters, through prisons, torture chambers, and slave hovels, over battlefields and to places of execution, if we were to open to him all the dark abodes of misery, where it shuns the gaze of cold curiosity, and finally were to allow him to glance into the dungeon of Ugolino, some place where prisoners starve to death, he too would certainly see in the end what kind of a world is this. Oh God, there's a thing in French. Meilleur des mondes possibles. Yeah, whether this would be the best world possible worlds. For whence did Dante get the material for his hell if not from the actual world of ours? So Dante and the Inferno. Um, so you will find these kind of objections to Al Ghazali's notion of the best of all possible worlds in his critics as well in the Islamic tradition, but not through the result of any kind of pessimism as we find in Schopenhauer. And Ormsby is quite correct in noting that. Yeah, so he has a very nice uh, turn of phrase here. Ormsby says, when the optimist points to the grand structure and noble design of the universe, his skeptical adversary points with unerring precision to the cracks in the ceiling, the mice in the wainscoting, and refuse in the corners. Um, so this kind of argument actually is very old. It goes all the way back to the Stoics. Um, uh, actually, it's the, it's the new academy arguing against the Stoics. So that's Car Carneades from uh, the New Academy that would be associated with Plato um, in combating the optimism of the Stoic Chrysippus. Um, so you have these many different views there in Western uh, civilization about theodicy and the problem of evil. Apparently there is um, an entire book on the history of the problem of evil in three volumes, but it's in German. Das Problem des Übels in der Philosophie des um, Abendlandes. Three volumes, Vienna, 1952 to 1959. Love to get a hold of that. <clears throat> but then on the other hand, you had vigorous defenders on a philosophical basis, not just people like Leibniz, of uh, the fact that the universe as it is reflects a supreme and divine wisdom but that this wisdom is somehow concealed because we're confronted by these examples of human misery so how do you explain that how do you uh explain away metaphysically these vexations these imperfections these instances of human misery suffering natural disasters plagues and so on and so forth um and ormsby makes note of these as well he alludes to the um, a few uh, a range of these. So he says one of them is that evil is an unavoidable consequence of human free will. That's true. There's also the idea that evil is a privation of the good, privatio boni, or that it's the necessary concomitant of the good. That's an idea that goes back to the Stoics. This privation, uh, that evil is a privation, is something which you find all the way back in uh, Plotinus, and it's developed to a great extent by people like Ibn Sina and also Thomas Aquinas. In Thomas Aquinas, you will find it in the Summa Contra Gentiles, 
Um, and he references that here. Ormsby references this on page 14 in footnote 34, that there's an older edition. It's it's in book three, but the, the newer edition, you will find uh, Summa, let's see, Summa Contra Gentiles. I thought I had one here. Um, let's see. Yeah, here it is. This is book three on Providence, University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame Press. This is the translation with introduction and notes by Vernon J. Bourk, B-O-U-R-K-E. And in that, it would be book three, chapter seven to nine, or pages 48 to 55. And Ibn Sina, in the Kitab shifa in the Ilahiyat, uh, it's on page, uh, he footnotes it here, page 415 uh, of volume two. And um, he mentioned some other works like the Kitab and Najat and the footnote, but this is the new kind of edition, dual language edition of Ibn Sina, in which case it would be, you know, let's be more precise. So it should be book nine. It should be book nine or Al Maqalatu Tasi'a Al Faslu Sadis, which here is on providence showing the manner of the entry of evil in divine predetermination. That's page 339. So, chapter 6, yeah, so that's Al-Fasl al ilahi um, It's important to, to mention those two because they are not further considered in this book because Al-Ghazali is coming at the problem from a different way and I think it might be uh, worth um, uh, maybe the digression of looking at what... A, argument Aquinas and what Ibn Sina presents once we finish this introduction maybe we'll add another lecture just looking at that but th those are the really important views uh, in favor of, of if you want to call it optimism or the notion of, of, of um, a metaphysical explanation of evil um, in the case of Plotinus that's in the Aeneids um, in case you're wondering it's Aeneid 1 8.3 Aeneid 3 2.5 there are various translations of uh, Plotinus. At the time when Ormsby wrote this book in the 80s, it would have been the Thomas McKenna translation, which, you know, sticklers of uh, scholars of ancient Greek have objections to. And there's the latest translation. I should have it up there by Lloyd Garrison. So uh, these are uh, really important um, sources. This notion of privation is also found in Augustine, in the City of God, book 9, it's, a, no, book 11, XI.22, the H. Bettinson translation. There's also the Confessions. I mean, there's there's a lot of things if you want to follow up in the footnote in the introduction, but what we're really concerned with is what happened in the Islamic world. So let's go now to um, section 3, which is Islamic formulations of theodicy. Now, again, here, he is not going to look at the philosopher, the philosophers, so Ibn Sina is not really discussed here. He's looking at it in the context of the early theological schools in Islam, of which the most important in, in, for this discussion is really the Mu'tazila. So the Mu'tazila were an early group of rationalist kind of theologians. They did not call themselves the Mu'tazila. Mu'tazila, is a, it would be the verb, and you get Mu'tazila, it means those who separate themselves. You know, the anecdotal story about this is that the guy who founded the so-called Mu'tazila was a person named Wasil ibn Ata, and he was originally a student of Al-Hasan al-Basri, and then he removed himself to a different part of the mosque. I'tazila an, I think he moved away from his teacher and sat at another pillar, and a bunch of people followed him, and you got the name. But they referred to themselves by their two most important principles, namely the divine unity, a tawheed and the notion of divine justice, al-adl, and hence ahlul adl wa tawheed So uh, he quite rightly says on page 16, Theodicy in Islam was formulated, excuse me, Theodicy in Islam was first formulated in reaction to conceptions of God that stressed his unqualified omnipotence. So you have many statements in the Qur'an. And the context of Islamic philosophy, Islamic theology, the Qur'an, the hadith are very important. Um, so you have many statements in the Qur'an that talk about وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Say things like, you know, that, and he is all powerful over all things. Um, this notion of the totalizing power of God. 
So then this becomes a problem, you know, reconciling it. And then the other major Islamic theological school is the Ash'ari school associated with Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari. And there this notion of divine omnipotence or the all-powerfulness or absolute divine will becomes very important because the Ash'aris stressed this very much. On page 17, he quite correctly states the Asharite school of theology, which broke away from Mu'tazilism in the 4th Islamic century, 10th century Gregorian or Christian or common era, and was to become the dominant orthodox school of Islamic theology, returned decisively to the earlier emphasis on omnipotence, but it did so in a way that allowed for the incorporation within its system of certain carefully qualified rationalistic elements taken over from Mu'tazilism. The key point is that, and I quote, the Asharite insistence on divine omnipotence led to a rejection of belief in free will and causality. It further entailed a radical revision of the very basis of the Mu'tazilite theodicy, the notion of an objective, intellectually discernible good and evil. <clears throat> so the Ash'aris are determinists. They deny any significance to cause and effect the law of causation and this leads to a radical understanding of good and evil especially in the context of the ethical valuation of acts so an act can only be deemed good or bad good or evil with reference to a divine revelation so if god had not said that murder was bad we wouldn't know it, and in fact, it wouldn't be bad. So that it's it's by the fact of the divine legislation itself that something becomes good or bad. So the Ashari emphasis on um, divine omnipotence created more problems than it than it could have solved, and it is these problems which Ormsby really focuses on in this study. So. <clears throat> Um, he has various quotes from the Quran and so forth in the next few pages and um, talks a little bit about the Mu'tazila so the Mu'tazila upheld this notion of what was called the optimum or in, in Mu'tazili terms al-aslah the, the, you know, the most beneficial he translates aslah here as the most salutary this is page 21 and this doctrine of the aslah, which he calls the doctrine of the optimum, took hold in Mu'tazili thought in the early 3rd century of the Hijra, the 9th century Christian or common era, and was particularly associated with the brilliant and versatile theologian Ibrahim ibn Sayyar al-Nadham. Ibrahim ibn Sayyar al-Nadham made an appearance, I think, in my fourth episode of the Lady of Heaven video, is because he did not really uphold the doctrine of the collective infallibility of the companions, the Adal of the Sahaba, and he has uh, upheld the idea of the attack by Umar al-Khattab and the house of Fatima alayhi salam. So this doctrine of al-Aslah was not universally uh, espoused by all of the Mu'tazila. There's an important sort of rivalry uh, distinction in the Mu'tazili schools. You had the Mu'tazila of Baghdad and the Mu'tazila of Basra. <coughs> <clears throat> so the doctrine was not unanimously accepted and we don't need to go into all of the details of between these different schools but suffice it to say that the Baghdad school or adherents you know people who were associated with the Mu'tazila of Baghdad tended to espouse the view that God must do al-aslah he must in his acts perform the optimal for human beings in both a deen wa dunya, in both religious and worldly matters. And they understood the term al-aslah, or the optimum, to mean the most appropriate, which in Arabic would be al-awfaq, in terms of divine wisdom and providence. The Mu'tazila associated with Basra, on the other hand, held that God's ob obligation, you know, to do the aslah, the awfaq, extended to deen only, uh, extended to matters of religion only. 
and sorry, it's not oh fuck the most appropriate. They they have they meant uh, they understood al asraf to mean uh, al anfa, the most beneficial. That's a very small distinction. And there was a lot of you know fuzziness also. You know this distinction between Baghdad and Basra is not as hard and fast as it seems. Suffice it to say that there were a lot of controversies among Mu'tazili thinkers. And this Baghdad and Basra division is just a kind of convenient way to to um, uh, qualify it. So the Ash'aris reject this notion of the Aslah, of the Mu'tazilis, because the Mu'tazila held that, that, that the aql, the human intellect, or intelligence, without any assistance from wahi, or divine revelation, was able to discern good and evil in acts. In other words, the ethical valuation of human actions <clears throat> was something which was susceptible to analysis by reason, or the, intellig or the faculty of the intellect, or the intelligence. Um, and so the Ashari school, you know, was very, very nervous about all this kind of thing and, and did not like it at all. Uh, Al-Ghazali is an extremely important figure. So this whole debate really is in, in, in reference to a statement made by Al-Ghazali. But these Mu'tazili and Ashari notions are in, in a kind of tension here. Because Al-Ghazali, whether he liked it or not, whether big fans of Al-Ghazali want to admit it or not, he's heavily influenced by philosophy, something which he attacks. He's famous for this book against the philosophers called Tahafut al-Falasifa. But before he did that, he undertook a very serious study of philosophy and compiled a book in which he summarized the doctrines of the philosophers called Maqasad al-Falasifa. And in fact, when this was translated into Latin, people thought that he himself was a philosopher. He wasn't an adherent of those ideas, he was just trying to summarize them. Nevertheless, he was influenced by <clears throat> um, um, ideas from philosophy in his own formulation of theology, because Al-Ghazali is, is officially a, an adherent of the Ash'ari school. Um, so, Al-Ghazali's story is very well known. Uh, if you haven't heard it before, he becomes very prominent at a very early age, <clears throat> at a very young age. He's appointed during the Seljuk period uh, to be a, 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 a teacher, a teaching sheikh, a teaching alim, a very important network of madrasas. And this uh, at the main campus, you could say, in, in Baghdad, the Mustansariya, and he was teaching there. And he authored a number of works in defense of the whole whole Sunniizing policy of the Seljuks. Um, and so these included refutations of philosophy, which was Tahafud al-Falasifa, which is known as the auto-destruction or the self-collapse or self-contradiction of philosophy. And he wrote treatises against the Ismaili Shia, who were very important at that time because they ruled Cairo. The Fatima dynasty represented a huge threat to... Uh, um, you know, the marginally, you know, Abbasid dynasty was really under Seljuk control. Um, <clears throat> so he wrote w works like um, Al Qistas al Mustaqim, Fadaih al Bataniya, against the um, against Ismailism. And eventually he just um, didn't have the heart. He realized he was some kind of a kind of, you know, fake, maybe establishment intellectual. And he undergoes a spiritual crisis, and he has to get out of it. He has to get out of the, his whole life situation, which is not something you could easily do in those days. You're you're working, you're 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 receiving your all these privileges and payment from the ruler of the time, who could easily have you killed or tortured or thrown in a dungeon. So he says he's going, he's leaving for the pilgrimage. He doesn't really go for the pilgrimage. He just disappears for 10 years. He says in his autobiography that he spent a lot of time in Bilad Sham and Philistine. And what was he doing? He was practicing uh, undergoing undergoing uh, rigorous ascesis, zuhd, taqwa, uh, ascetic practices. And he becomes a Sufi. And when he comes out of all of this, he, he returns to the world, he writes a book called Ihya Ulum al 
the revival or the revivification, if you use the phrase of Dr. Nabi Amin Faris, who translated you know, the, the first book of the Kitab al ahya It's a large book, a long time back. Nabi Amin Faris, he translated it like that. But revival you know, rolls off the tongue better. Revival of the religious sciences. So it's in this book, Kitab al ahya where he talks about the perfect rightness of the actual. لَيْسَ فِي الْإِمْكَانِ أَبْدَعْ مِمَّا كَانِ There is not in possibility anything more wonderful than what is. And this sparked a number of reactions and attacks over uh, Islamic history from the time of Al-Ghazali all the way up to uh, modern times. <clears throat> so that's what is looked at in this study. I think it's a very interesting book and it's a great way of introducing people to questions uh, in Islamic uh, philosophy and theology. And so that's what we will do in the subsequent um, lectures. We will look at uh, how this problem was dealt with, look at the locus classicus of, you know, basically what Al-Ghazali said, first of all. And we will also look at other views, uh, which are not mentioned in the book, especially that of Ibn Sina, and we might as well contrast that with, with Aquinas. So I think... Um, once we see how Al-Ghazali has formulated the question, it would be sensible to look at Ibn Sina's formulation and see what Aquinas has to say as well. And then we'll look at the various reactions over uh, time to this problem. So just to sum up then, in terms of the books that you need, you need Theodicy and Islamic Thought. That's the basic book. You've got to have that. And then if you're interested, you can get a copy of Voltaire's Candide and Theodicy by Leibniz and read those also because that of course is not really an Islamic philosophy but it is very interesting I don't really believe in all of these divisions and so forth I mean Islamic philosophy um, I think is relevant today as well and um, as are the, the, the great books of Western civilization as well so I'm, I'm for reading all of these and I also found this uh, modern kind of um, compilation of, of studies on the problem of evil would be very useful. It's a relatively small, manageable work of 200 odd pages entitled The Cambridge Companion to the Problem of Evil, edited by Chad Meister and Paul K. Moser. I found this to be a useful volume and there actually is a chapter on Islam and the problem of evil in this as well by Timothy Winter, TJ Winter, a.k.a. Abdul Hakim Murad. Um, I'm not endorsing him, but uh, he is the one who authored the chapter on Islam in that book. So I think that ends it for today. Uh, thank you for watching or thank you for listening, whatever it is. And um, I look forward to uh, continuing this in the future, inshallah. Wallahu alam.